it's great to be here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Martin, for inviting me. And thank you for showing where Doc Planner is on the continuum of the evolution of the marketplaces. And probably we are somewhere between the first and the second ape. <laughs> so we've got a lot of stuff, but um, we have th that basically means that we have a lot, a lot more things uh, to cover. But it also means that we did uh, a lot already. And this is what I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, today. So we started Doc Planner. There were, f there were five of us. It was around nine years ago. Um, today I'm the head of HR of Doc Planner. And before that, I was, a head of, uh, I was an HR guy at Unilever. That's where I learned HR. And uh, I come from Getschvold. It's a village in the north. And yeah. Asking uh, why is it important? Why am I saying that? Well, it's because today the Doc Planner crew could populate three Getschvouts, <laughs> which I think personally is a pretty cool thing. And moreover, those two places would be pretty partyful because half of the Doc Planner team is actually from Latin America. So, especially around the carnival time, a lot of things would be happening. Uh, right, so we moved from five people to uh, 1,500. And I would say that there are three main things that we were paying a lot of attention to. Product, customers, and people. And today, we will be talking about people. And like every company that scales and has a lot, a lot more people adding, we have values. Huh? And we try to measure our culture as well. So um, we use Office Vibe to put some numbers to it. Many people would say that we run our company in a very human way. Um, which is cool, again, because in Polish it means that prowadzimy uh, firmę po ludzku. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty cool thing for me. But it was really tough, and why is it worth talking about the human element of scaling per se without touching the product or, or customers? Just to give you the idea of the journey that, we, that we've gone through. Uh, so this is the evolution of the size of the team since the beginning. And um, just doubling the team at the beginning, when it's pretty small, it's already a big deal for many people because suddenly they realize that half of them have been here for just a few months. And then when you keep adding the guys, then you have even bigger challenges because you're not only like doubling or quadrupling the number of guys, but you also have to onboard and, and manage them. Um, so on one hand, it's really cool because it makes you proud. Your company is growing and the number of people um, you know, uh, is corresponding with that. But it's not always a very good thing. Um, as, especially when you're a founder, you really want to touch everybody in the company. Uh, you want them to feel like you right now and earlier. So you want them to feel the same about the efficiency of expenses. You want them to look at every penny that they spend. You want them to set ambitious goals. You want them to be determined in execution and all these things. Uh, but yeah, it's really hard when you get to a number of people like that. Um, so you need to figure out a way. And today I want to share with the three things that I think we did and we've learned on our journey uh, of Doc Planner. So the first thing is scale yourself. And there are three aspects of scaling yourself. First, have co-founders. And it's not only for the obvious reasons, right? So um, having um, you know, other talented guys that have other talents than you, that complement you. And it's not only about the hard work that can be done. There can be a lot more work done when you're five or three, rather than when you can, can get done when you're just one or two. No? But it's also the thing that you can lean on someone else. You can be like super honest and someone can pull you. you know? Building a company, at least in our case, it was nine years, come on. Do you remember what you were doing nine years ago? Maybe you were in a totally different place. So both privately and professionally, you go through a lot of things. And when you have people that you can lean on, it just gets that much more probable that you're going to go through those hard times. So we have the example of Brainly with uh, you know, Tomek, uh, Wukash, and Michal. Um, Booksy, two co-founders. A brand 24, three co-founders, Doc Planner, five, Google, two. Oh, you know that. So it really, it, it really is one of the things that um, is, is already there. It's an evidence. Now, the second thing of scaling yourself is to figure out what you are shitty at and find complementary people, great complementary people, and hire them. So uh, probably you already um, have your own self-awareness and analysis of what you're really good at and what you're bad at, what you like doing and what you don't like doing. 
professionally, I mean. Um, so some of you might be uh, thriving when you work with other people and when you meet and when you like brainstorm together. Some of you prefer to work individually. Some of you love the design and hate analytics and some others of you uh, are the opposite. It's great to admit it because the ROI of one euro that you put into your weakness uh, probably is going to be like a multiplier of two, maybe three. The multiplier on investing in your strength is definitely going to be much, much bigger. Um, this is my insights discovery report. It's a psychometrics that is just describing, you know, a human personality. One of many tools available on the market. And there are those four energies. And you can see uh, how much effort, that was a, a few years ago, how much energy and how much effort I was putting into the blue energy. Very quickly, the red energy is about decision making and focus on execution. The yellow one is about being sociable, open and very, you know, people oriented. The green one is about being sensitive and lots of empathy. And the blue one is about being detail oriented, planning ahead, you know, being very uh, scrupulous. So you can imagine what is the makeup of, um, of the HR team. You, know? you will see a lot of blue guys uh, on board of the, of the people experience team and uh, people experience managers. Uh, and the last thing is uh, building great managers. So this is the way that obviously is the, the only way that you can touch all those people if you can, if you can have great managers. And uh, there are so many books that have already been written about that. There is one by Levy about seven hidden reasons why people leave. Uh, reason number one is managers. When we were asking our guys why they love Doc Planner or why they leave, 80% of them say it's about the bosses. Um, so we started measuring uh, how great managers do we have on board very early on. And we use this Office Vibe tool again. So we can see that the rows are representing the teams and the managers, and the columns are representing the characteristics, the specific areas. So team members you know, fill out those surveys on a regular basis. And in this way, every manager actually knows um, how happy their team is and uh, how great managers they are every day. More than that, they can compare themselves against other managers. So basically they know their relative performance and it builds like this a little bit of competition between them. So they really try a lot harder. And if you think about the fact that there are 170 managers on board of Dog Planner, I mean, just the awareness of this is like ultra, ultra powerful. Well, I will show you one more uh, graph with data that, that supports that. But this is what we discovered, and this is definitely one of the big learnings that we have. Okay. Uh, another point of learning that we had after those uh, nine years is that recruitment is tough. Uh, I mean, if you take any business book that is out there, um, you will definitely find a few pages or maybe a full chapter that would say something like, people are the most important asset of the company, or that your company should scale only as fast as you're able to attract amazing people. That's all true. I want to share with you the maybe less obvious things that we learned around recruiting. So the first thing is uh, um, to avoid outsourcing while you recruit. And it makes sense, think about it. You're a startup, you're building up, and you're signing a contract with an, a recruiting agency that has a lot of customers, probably it has a lot of loyal customers, more loyal than you because you're just starting with them. The second thing is that uh, they have a lot of candidates and their business well, may be a little bit like a marketplace. <laughs> but uh, the, the likelihood that that company will provide you with the best candidates that they have available just to your company, I mean, it's not super high unless your brother runs the company. <laughs> or your uncle or your father, maybe. No? Um, another great uh, benefit of doing recruitment in-house is that um, with passive candidates. So you want the best people you can attract, especially early on, because those people will be the future managers, they will be running the company, they will be the ones to go to the countries that you open to, to make sure that your culture is there, they will focus on the goals, uh, help with recruiting the other people, and so on and so on. So it's really, really crucial uh, the, uh, the earlier you start. So it's a lot easier to draw attention 
of great people, when you write to them as a founder or a leader of the company, than when another research company is doing it on your behalf. And the last and probably most important thing about doing recruiting yourself is this. 50% of the time, when we were recruiting for a new position or opening a new country, we realized that we had no idea who we were looking for. Of course, we created the job description. Of course, we more or less knew what the job was about to be. But when we started meeting candidates, then we were like, no, 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 he's not going to do it. And then another one and another one. So it really helps you learn what is it that you're really looking for, which skills and which people. It's a great learning curve for you as an entrepreneur um, on this, on this um, vital uh, element. The second thing about recruiting is to have an ideal candidate profile. And I don't mean a job description. I mean like a set of characteristics that um, hopefully will guarantee that whoever you bring on board in sales, finance, HR, doesn't matter, will do an amazing job in your company. And the first consideration to make uh, in this case is whether you're looking for experience or whether you're looking for talents. And in our case, we look for talents 70% of the time. And again, if you think about it, um, the likelihood of finding someone who has done exactly what you're looking for in exactly the same circumstances, so with the same customers, with the same team, same set of problems, is super low. You cannot copy-paste a person. So experience is a good predictor of the future success, but uh, we believe that talent is even more. So we created this um, ideal candidate profile when we bet on those three things. Uh, intellect, ambition, and passion. So we can have someone, I mean, there's this anecdote about smart people that they have this um, tendency of not making fools out of themselves too frequently. You know? um, and that's really useful in a professional environment, of course. But they learn fast, they have good memory, they are problem solvers. If you don't have ambition and you're just smart, then it's very unlikely that you will put this intelligence into work. And the third thing is passion, which is channeling the other two. So if you're passionate about finance and you're very ambitious, so you want to be like one of the best and you're also very smart, the likelihood that you're going to be an amazing finance person is a lot higher than if your passion is windsurfing. No? So it's good to have that covered. And the last thing about uh, making recruitment a little bit easier is um, having analytical recruiters. If you think about it, recruitment is a very analytical process. Um, you create certain situations and then you try to see if you have negative or positive evidence that shows whether the person has the skills or characteristics that you're looking for or not. So the thing that we learned is to have super analytical recruiters on board. And this is the, um, the number that it's, it's an average SHL score of the recruiters on board of Doc Planner team. So SHL is a company, they do all sorts of tests, but they also do the analytical ones. So my score is 84, there are a lot of people at uh, 99. No? It's, a, it's a very big learning for us, if you scale through people. Okay, and the last thing to share with you uh, is um, creating a culture of goals and not a culture of tasks. Um, written or not, every company has a culture even if it's two people, if it's 1,000 people, and so on. Um, that's a fact. Um, then about the definition of culture. So there are many of them, but the one that we chose to like the most is one that is saying that culture is a small number of things that are repeated many times every day. And it makes sense, because when you think about Culture is like repetitive habits, things that repeat over. It's much easier to repeat five things and create five habits than to create 25 habits. Huh? And then it's everyday work. Culture is not the, the beautiful walls or great you know, company events or this kind of stuff. That too. Huh? But the main thing about culture is what happens every day. What are the processes? What you talk about uh, during your meetings? What do you promote your people for? Huh? How do you give increases and all this stuff? Um, so we decided to focus on, on goals in our culture, and there are a couple of aspects uh, related to that. The first one is outputs are not inputs. Just because you are doing a lot doesn't mean that you get a lot done, right? 
So just because you are doing a lot, just because you're busy and you complete a lot of projects and so on, it doesn't mean that you get a lot of work done. And it's very important to define done. What you measure is what you get. I mean, we all know that. And of course, there are tools on the market, and Google was a very big promoter of the OKRs. But let's study one case. Well, this is like a, an OKR sample um, that comes from you know, Startup Lab, Ven uh, Google Ventures. So it's like a pretty cool source. But let, let's study it uh, very quickly. Improve, bro improve Brogger's reputation, the objective. All right, cool. So um, maybe it's just like a, an um, inspiring mission statement, because it doesn't have any measure attached to it. It's hard to call it an output. Maybe there's something more in the key results. All right, re-establish Bloggle's leadership by speaking at three industry events. Right, so how does speaking at three industry events is going to ensure that you improve the Blogger's reputation? I mean, you could equally deteriorate the Blogger's reputation if the performance on those three events is poor. So it's not so easy to get the OKRs right. It's not so easy to create you know, understanding among a huge amount of people uh, about this difference between inputs and outputs. Um, so that's about goal setting. But it's also about the feedback that you give um, when the time comes to settle the, the performance and evaluate the performance. And here, when we were thinking about that, we said, OK, so. If you have a goal and you achieve 100% of the goal, that's clear. If you overachieve, that's clear as well. But what happens if you achieve 95% of your goal? Or 92? Or 80? Is it good enough or not? And we had the discussion. And those two gentlemen helped us um, solve and settle that discussion. Um, I guess we all know the guy on the, my right, right? So, right? Yeah, he was a very successful rally driver at the time. And who knows the other guy? Fedor. Fedor. <laughs> yeah, Fedor Power. It's Fedor now Emelianenko. He's Russian, and he was an MMA fighter. He was called, or he was named, a Caesar of MMA. Now, the big difference between the two is that um, when Kubica arrives at the finish line, he can get first, but he can also get second or third. He's still on the podium, being second or third, it's not as good as the first place, but you know you still get a medal. In Fedor's case, it's either you stand up or you're down. And that's why we decided that when we settle goals with the guys and when we give feedback to them, we do it Fedor way. You either achieve your goal 100% or more or not. And it had amazing consequences on the culture of the company. Uh, it had consequences not only when it comes to determination and focus on um, execution, but it also gave um, uh, a lot of learning and impact on how you set goals, because you don't want to set goals that you're not able to achieve. And then if you achieve 80% of the, of the goals and multiply it by 1,500, holy shit, your company is in deep shit. No? If the goals are properly connected and they add up to the company goal. That is why this Fedor way uh, we discovered many years ago, it's still on and we still believe in it. And it's like a, one of the big cornerstones of our whole hard culture, I would say, pretty hard culture. Um, so the way that we uh, included all of those learnings is in our interpretation of OKRs. So you still have this inspiring mini mission statements that speak to your heart. But then you also have the outputs and the inputs. So indicators are outputs and the tasks are the inputs. And those speak to your mind, they speak to your gut. Uh, and as you can see, uh, even if you have like a blue uh, link, there's a table behind it with lots of numbers that show what exactly the goals are per country, per department, when it comes to turnover or recruiting and this kind of stuff. They are personal. So there is no joint responsibility. We don't create like uh, department OITs or something like that. They're individual. Huh? And we also follow through. That's super important. How many times is it so that you agree certain goals to be achieved and then you know, the time has passed, is it a quarter or maybe a year, and you sometimes even forget what the goals were in the first place? How are people supposed to believe that the goals that you set are actually important for the company or for you? Another element of this consistency is that each of us does the hard work. So we are not managers managing. You know? 
And if you think about it, it, uh, it it's really interesting what, what happens in the companies because it means that if you're an amazing finance manager and you become the CFO and you only focus on managing people because you cannot treat them as mini CEOs, you have to treat them like employees and oversee what they do every week, and you become only the team leader as a finance guy, then the best finance guy in the company is not doing any finance or is doing very little of it. And the second uh, consequence of not doing this way is um, that you actually set a great example. So when people grow, when they aspire to bigger roles, when they aspire to be promoted, they don't think that they will be a manager and do something like this. They think that they will be, that they will be still continuing in their profession and they have a motivation to grow their skills over time, all the time. Oh, it's really amazing. So you're building not only leaders and managers, but also better professionals, you know, better gurus at, at their areas. So this OIT thing, it looks super simple, but there's like a lot of hard work behind it, and the hell it works. Um, this is surprising. This is again an office vibe chart, which shows um, the happiness. So uh, the employee net promoter score. Um, so basically the same question like on the market that is being asked. And we were pretty surprised when we discovered it for the first time after a few months from implementation. Um, you know, because people are happy with all those, you know, goals and stress and featherweight and all this stuff. And it made us, made us think. And uh, we realized that if you get the recruitment right and if you create the right environment for the people in the company, then they will be happy and at the same time working their butts off. You know? And that is a very good thing because as, as Case Colin, he's, he's our investor and he's uh, one of the most successful um, you know, business people in the, uh, in the online uh, world. As he put it, without blood, uh, sweat and tears, it's very hard to build a great company. And uh, if you enter Doc Planner, you will uh, find a lot of blood, sweat and tears on our floors. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we've got a question over there and another one here. Is there a... Oh, awesome. Hey, thanks for, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, Michal Faber's pre-commerce. Um, so on behalf of all windsurfers, I would like to say that we also are passionate about our jobs and uh, you know, just leaving blood, sweat and tears on the floors of our, our companies. And not only that, but in our company, uh, we recruit people who share their passions outside of work, you know, because of work-life balance. And for example, Anna here, she works at our marketing and sales department and she's a surfer, just like me. And we have a shared, you know, set of goals outside and inside of our company. So, you know, that's an amazing presentation and also scaling up to 1500 people is, uh, is just, you know, great. But I think sharing those passions outside of work is quite important. Definitely, and uh, congratulations on having so many passions. Hey, um, yeah, I guess it's standard to say your name, so I'm Jeroen from, from Speed Invest. But um, so one question on the previous chart was actually quite interesting on the NPS. Um, obviously, it didn't start out very strongly, I would say. What was the what was the biggest learning that you that that you had at that specific time? that made us grow the NPS further. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you started at, let's say, below nine, so you made a tremendous progress, but what was the biggest insight you had when you scored a relatively low number? Uh, develop managers. So we assumed that a lot of the guys that were on board of, of the company, they would naturally become great managers, just like, let's say, we did, you know, because we had to somehow do it. And we underestimated that, you know, so the first few months we thought, okay, we need to get the response rate right and, you know, have enough of data and evidence. But then we clearly realized after two or three months uh, and, and that was it. So the first thing that we did is this publicity and publicity is amazing. When you work with smart, ambitious and passionate people, when they realize how they are doing versus the rest of the, of the population. 
So the other chart that I showed earlier, um, it had a very big impact. Um, if you would ask if there are any you know, leadership courses or something like that that are worth recommending, I don't have any. Uh, it's really about you know, work and experience because you can have a classroom and talk about difficult performance conversations, but until you have some of them, um, you don't know anything. You know? So it's really about being close to those guys and each of us had like between five and 10 guys that we commit to grow um, and share everything that we know um, in a, let's say, coaching way maybe. Um, and that's how it started. So, hi, it's Kasper here. Hi. Great presentation, thanks for, for that. It's, it's really impressive and I can see how much work you put into it and I can imagine this being very, all those uh, tools being very important in such a big company. But what's the, the, the HR 101 for, for a startup? What do you think is the, the crucial things that should be addressed for in, in HR when, when you're eight people sitting in two rooms? Um, recruiting. I mean, if you're uh, thinking about um, doing HR as founders and you don't have an HR person, then it's great if one of you can become a recruiter or maybe already has passion to it. If not, then consider hiring a recruiter, like a professional one, and get the recruiting right. And um, there are as many great examples, as many um, as bad examples that I know where everything came down to, you know, the first recruitments that you make. Very nice, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, you mentioned that your approach was do or die before Kubica approach. Um, do you involve uh, employees in setting the goals for, uh, for their pers personal and for their departments? Or this is uh, strictly strictly uh, manager's function, right? So thanks. Sure. The short answer to this question is, of, of course, even more so. The goals are created by the people, and then they are discussed and approved with the managers. I mean, that's the only way to have like the real ownership of, of what needs to be done. Um, regarding this net promoted score, it's uh, common that sales department has lower net promoted scores than other departments, or it is not a good? No, we didn't, at least not in our case, we didn't see that uh, analogy. What we do see is the differences per countries. So for example, Latin America's countries are just happier. No? <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. The average in Mexico or in, um, uh, in Brazil is like around 75, 72, something like that. Uh, in Poland, the average is closer to this, like 55, 52. No? So we learned to read it this way. And uh, between the departments, we do not see uh, the differences. Sorry? <laughs> Lucky them. Uh, Lutin, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned that you choose talent in 70% of the cases. I wanted to ask about the remaining 30, so about the recruiting of, of experienced people, of adding people at the later stage, adding people who will not be you know, molded into your culture right away and you actually want to bring something new to the company. Can you share some experiences and differences? Right, right. Um, I would say that bringing people like that does not change the, uh, the approach, so talent is still first. And probably one of the best examples is uh, Kadu. Uh, Kadu is the country manager of Brazil. He came from Team Mobile. Uh, he was running a team of 2,000 people before, you know, in a telecom company in Brazil. And then suddenly, he steps into a startup where he's the sales guy number one, and he needs to do the first 15 sales to customers that he never met, except maybe his sister, because I think his sister is a doctor. Um, a product that he never touched and understood. You know? um, so, of course, there's a lot of experience that Cadu, Carlos, brought in when it comes to people management, speed of scaling, amazing network in Brazil that he had. But if it wasn't for you know, those three things that I mentioned, then I think it would be very hard. He had a lot of passion to sales. That's why he was not afraid of going out and selling, because he was selling all the time, even in Team Mobile. You know? Super ambitious. He was one of the top two sales directors in Brazil. 
There are like three or four regions there. And he wanted more. He could have settled on a, he had a super high salary. You know, in Brazil, the discrepancy is gigantic between, you know, when you start your career and when you're on the top. It's just unbelievable. He took a half uh, salary cut, 50% salary cut just to join us. But he was very ambitious. He knew that there is an opportunity and he wanted to, uh, to be someone like that, be the CEO. Uh, and obviously he was, he was very smart. No? So it was like a good combination of things. Hi, um, here on the right ding, side. Ding, 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 okay. <laughs> on the right side. Martin Zabielski from Market One Capital. Thank you for the great presentation. It's probably one of a few I've seen here in Poland where uh, Fedor uh, was the good example and our national hero, Robert Kubisa, was not that good. Um, but my question is, uh, when did you realize that you need like a specific or separate HR function? When, you know, how big was the company when you just started to build this uh, HR function? Right. Um, so the first point is that we are a pretty international company. So we love Polish people as much as we love Russian people and Brazilian people and Mexican people. So wherever we can take the example is great. Um, in Doc Planner, it happened by coincidence because I just happened to be an HR guy. Um, but I was having this discussion with uh, Piotr Kulesza the other day. I think he's not here. He's from RT RTA Ventures. Um, and he was one of the early investors. And we were chatting, I think, like a year ago about that. Um, what is the right size of the company? Or what is the right stage? And um, I'm obviously biased, but what he said is that um, when you're a team of, of 30 people, uh, you know, this network effect and the number of connections, the number of lines starts to kick in. And probably as, a, as, as founders, you have less and less time to recruit, to focus really on recruiting. Um, so when you see your company uh, growing, there's high potential. Um, um, your KPIs are showing that you can double or triple the company every year. Um, and your team is closing on 30 people. I mean, that's the most specific answer to this question that I can give. Hi, yeah. Lucian. Uh, yeah. Jacek from Market One. Thanks for the great presentation. Uh, I have a question because uh, as Doc Planner, you have many offices around the world, uh, and this uh, working on the culture is a sort of continuous process, and uh, you all the time try to improve the procedures, the processes, and so on. I was wondering whether all of the ideas happen in, in Warsaw, or is it like a distributed uh, group of people around different offices which work on that? Yeah, when it comes to the things about culture and about people and, and recruiting, um, then uh, we have very senior HR managers in each of the six markets that we operate in. So it really comes from that. And you really want this because it's really great diversity. When you have some ideas coming from Brazil, they um, might seem strange at the beginning. So for example, one of the projects that we're running right now about sales efficiency, so moving C and B players to the A player group. It's called the Miyagi project. I don't know how many of you remember Miyagi. I didn't know what Miyagi was, but it's this karate kid, you know, master guy. You know? And so w when you talk about exotic and making your company exotic, um, it's, it's really great to really understand um, other cultures this way. And it really wakes up some hidden DNA that you have. Because it's cool no? to, call, to call the project Miyagi rather than a sales efficiency 2.0 project. No? Um, those guys are really also hard working. And you, you, you can say that it's a lot harder to find you know, a, um, a great match to your startup um, in, in Mexico than in Germany or in Barcelona. So probably that's important when you consider the location of, of your startup. But it's possible to do. And this is what we, what we strive for. So the, 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 the amazingness of the guys in all, each of the locations that we have is, is the same. No? Hope that answers your question. Okay. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a question about the sales team, because yeah. it's like huge. And the sales model is based like mainly on people, because mm -hmm. you're acquiring leads digitally, but they are converting them into contracts, yeah. like manually mainly. Have you ever thought about 
more automatic process, like not, with no need to scale the team so much. What is the reason that you're still basing the huge amount of sales on people, not on automation? Right. So I would say that um, we do already do that, but maybe not on a scale that is available. Maybe we are missing something. So we started with field sales, and that's like really um, uh, human heavy. Lots of lots of numbers, uh, lots of lots of teammates uh, are necessary there. Uh, but then around two years ago, we started working with inside sales teams. So basically, guys that sell over the phone, and the efficiency, the number of contracts sold uh, per person is twice the number. The turnover is half the turnover of people. So how many people you know leave or are asked to leave? Um, the motivation is also higher. So there are many, many benefits. And we can also see that um, many companies like, like Groupon, for example, uh, many others, they also switch to this model of, of inside sales. And that also allows you to automate the process of this prospect and lead processing. You know? So um, the answer to the question is that, yes, we, we are doing it. Maybe not uh, fast enough, but this is like uh, also connected with the fact that we don't want to revolutionize uh, too much. It's, it's better to uh, gr grow and, and change by evolution because that allows you also to grow uh, fast. No? And even at the scale that we are at, when it comes to the number of people, we double the company, the company revenue-wise every year. No? So we just want to make those changes, but gradually. Will there be a third step, like fully automated process with a funnel that uh, makes a doctor to sign up by himself? I don't know. I mean, we sell like 5% of our deals online. And I think it also depends on the, uh, the customers and, and their nature. Well, I mean, and Brazil. <laughs> a little bit, yes. No? I mean, if you think about doctors, they are not the, the most digitalized group of people in the world, in any country. It's becoming so, but it's, it's not the case. So we made a lot of experiments with online uh, sales, but um, if you want to grow fast, there's a lot of education to be done on the market as well, because... Um, um, when our sales process is really uh, explaining to the doctor what our product is and that patients are actually online and everything. So I don't think that we'll be able to move to like an online sales or fully automated anytime soon. Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, we're running um, out of time for, for more questions. So please give a warm round of applause to Lucian. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you.